So we'll just give it a minute here. <clears throat> Good evening, and welcome to a copyrighted Zoom talk sponsored by Artist Talk on Art on Monday, November 21st, 2022, at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Doug Shear, President. Tonight, we're featuring a presentation and a brief interview, which I'll be conducting with the Nigerian-American artist Osi Odu. Join us next Monday for a panel on Hudson Valley Contemporary Art Institutions, which was organized and will be moderated by Alyssa Pritzker, a visual artist, independent curator, and art columnist. With panelists, Carlin Benson, interim curator and exhibitions manager at the Samuel Dorsky Museum of Art at SUNY New Paltz, Elizabeth Keithline, Exhibition Director at the Woodstock Artists Association Museum, also known as WAM. Mara Mills, Education Director Coordinator and Director of Performance at the new Hudson Valley Museum of Contemporary Art. And Nicole Hayes, Curator and Project Manager at Art OMI. That's next Monday at 7 p.m. And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest presenter, Osi Odu. Osi Odu was born in Nigeria in 1956 and studied at the University of Ife in Nigeria, where he received his Bachelor of Fine Arts degree with first class honors in 1980. He went on to study at the University of Georgia in Athens in the US and earned his Master of Fine Arts degree in painting and drawing in 1984. In 1994, he earned a postgraduate certificate in education from the University of Kent in Canterbury, the UK. Osi Odu maintains a visual language of geometric shapes and a palette of monochromatic blacks, whites, grays, and primary colors to explore the tangible and intangible aspects of the self and self-consciousness. His techniques draw from ancient Yoruba philosophies and modern Western approaches, such as the idea that objects can contain, channel, and transform natural forces. Following the Yoruba concept of Ori Inu, uh, the inner head, and Odu's work, many of them displayed as a series of self-portraits, draw our attention to the artist's focus on the head as a signifier of consciousness and as an object of self and self-knowing. Odu's work has shown uh, in solo and group exhibitions worldwide, including Germany, Nigeria, Japan, South Africa, the United Kingdom and the United States. He has shown at prestigious institutions such as Iwa Liwa House in 1995, the British Museum in 2003, the Smithsonian Institute's National Museum of African Art in 2006, and the Musea, Musea de Palazzo Grimani during the Venice Biennale in 2015. In 2018, he was the recipient of the Pollock Krasner Foundation grant. In addition to his longstanding artistic practice, Audu also works as a curator, most recently organizing a traveling group exhibition, Abstract Minded, works by six contemporary African artists that showed at the Nam Namdi Center for Contemporary Art in Detroit, the Samuel Dorsky Museum of Art in New York State, and the August Wilson Center in Pittsburgh. His work is in numerous private and public collections, including the Smithsonian Institute's National Museum of African Art, the British Museum, 
the Horniman Museum, the Newark Museum, and the Hood Museum, the Iwa Liwa House, and Nigeria's National Gallery. Osi Odu currently resides in New York's Hudson Valley. To start things off, as we begin to, to look at uh, the PowerPoint presentation that Osi has assembled, um, I'm posing sort of, let's say, a memory uh, that always struck me as sort of uh, um, quirky, let's call it. At Artist Talk and Art, uh, around 1990, 1991, we had a panel discussion that paired two white South African artists with two black South African artists. They all knew each other, they were colleagues. The two white artists were showing what I would call uh, tribal traditional or tribal centric uh, uh, African art, uh, uh, while the two black African artists were showing what, what we could only call Europeanized or globalized or Eurocentric art. I saw this as interesting, if confounding, as a juxtaposition, and it's something that stuck with me all this time. On the surface, my appraisal of Osi's oeuvre, both the sculpture and the painting, but particularly the sculpture, led me to initially interpret his art to be solidly in the classical geometric abstractionist tradition of European art. But he himself ascribes many other qualities to his own work that touch on race, nationality, gender, and sexuality. So I, I was wondering, and I, I asked him, how does the work compare the tangible to the intangible? And in what way does it delve into those qualities that you claim it does? O.C. Thank you so much, Doug. Thank you for inviting me to take part in this dialogue, in this conversation. Um, it's much appreciated. Every opportunity for me to talk about my work is uh, obviously very, very, very welcome, and I'm very delighted to be part of it. Thank you. Um, there are two aspects of what you just asked, which I'll be talking about. First is the conception, perhaps the, the misconception, that um, Af you know, abstract art originates from, from Europe. You know, um, and I'll be looking at the, you know, explaining my work vis-a-vis -vis the the uh, tangible and the intangible, and how my my work actually uh, expresses uh, these two aspects, which I see to be the you know the two <laughs> modes in which consciousness um, expresses itself, perhaps. So the the first one, the um, you know, abstraction as a formal language of expression is as indigenous to African art and culture, visual, visual, visual culture, as it is to most uh, traditional, perhaps, you know, traditional cultures in the world. Um, certainly, if you look at um, some of the textile, if we may go to to the, uh, can we just go to the first slide? Because there is something I need to talk about in the first slide too. Um, we have the first slide. It's coming. Okay. Yeah, the, the title of the talk itself is the, the head as a magic box, you know, use of geometry, color and texture in my work. And I'll be talking about that throughout the presentation. But I'd just like to address the, the, the first question part of the question of the first question. Yeah, so if you look at um, some of the uh, textile design traditions uh, the next, in Africa. The next slide, please. The next slide, yes. And you will see that it is purely geometric. You will see a lot of you know, triangles, rectangles, um, vertical, horizontal lines. This is purely geometric. And this is what you will find in most of the traditional textile design. This is the kente cloth from Ghana. 
Uh, we also have another uh, similarly um, uh, woven traditional, which is which is it's not actually included in my slides, but it's called the actual case woven, and there are geometric patterns in it. In the picture you are looking at, you can see uh, women painting walls of uh, of a building with with geometric patterns, um, very geometric. So the the in fact geometry, I would say, is the um, is a primal formal language that everybody auto automatically connects with, and it you know can it makes sense to to you know to us um, bypassing any kind of con you know conceptual analysis. You just see a triangle, you see a circle, and you just connect with it, um, and it delights the eye. Uh, but in most in some of these cases. The, the reason for painting those or creating those shapes uh, goes beyond, um, the reason goes beyond uh, decorative. Sometimes they are symbolic and are used actually as a means of uh, artistic expression. Uh, the next slide, you would see uh, how even hair, hair styling, uh, is inf influenced by geometry, you know, geometric, uh, you know, triangular, rectangular, um, you know, curves, very geometric. So, so just like the 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 title of the exhibition I curated, basically the the traditional African artist is abstract minded because I cur I curated this show that Doug mentioned already uh where in which i you know invited uh, six well five including myself uh contemporary african artists who work in the field of abstraction to to show their work together so that <clears throat> we can begin to all re return to this whole um conversation about abstraction and african art um, so if we can go to the next slide please now, the uh, instead of abstraction coming into Africa from Europe, the, the reverse is actually uh, the case because the, the focus of much European art um, dating as far back as the early Renaissance, looking at the work of Giotto, Giotto uh, di Bondoni, uh, Simabue too, will and, and peaking really at the you know high Renaissance in the 16th century with the works of uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, but more, more specifically Leonardo da Vinci, uh, we will see that uh, recording perceivable, you know, recording from observation, recording accurately, um, was the focus of art, um, even though. It is arguable that some of those angels painted were actually observed, uh, were painted from observation. But the idea is that the 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 composition, obviously, is a composite image. The composition would have been done uh, from looking at a particular person alive, and um, and 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 using using the form of that person as a as a way of um, conceptualizing what an angel would look like and, and stuff like that. So Western art has always been, or European art more specifically, uh, has always had this focus of recording observation as accurately as possible. Um, it wasn't until the camera was invented that that main focus of painting was then a challenge. and and But then the painting survived that challenge and continued to be representational, um, but it wasn't until Picasso actually encountered a sculpture, you know, the sculpture piece from Congo, that he, this, and he was taken by the geometry in the form, you know, the stylization in the form, that he decided to, um, to incorporate that sense of geometric stylization in, in his work. And that was the beginning of, or the origin of, of Cubism, as well as the beginning of 
the introduction of abstraction into, into you know, the European focus as a means of expressing, you know, self-expression, expressing form. I know that Cezanne also looked at this whole idea of, uh, you know, reducing visible form into, you know, to the square, the cylinder and the cone, which are the basic, you know, uh, formats for, for abstract e expression. Um, the work of um, many artists thereafter uh, took on this, this pursuit of abstraction as well of uh, expressing themselves. Um, so the, this piece you're looking, well, this, this image you're looking at uh, are the studies, you know, based on uh, the, the Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, which I'm sure most of you, if not all of you are familiar with. Uh, but that was the introduction of abstraction into, into the West via, um, you know, via African art. <clears throat> so it is, it is the reverse. Um, in fact, the, the, the work I am doing, if, if we can go to the next slide, please. The work I'm doing uh, has been described by one of the uh, curators at New York Museum at the time, Krista Clark. Uh, what my work has been de de um, described as reclaiming abstraction because there is always this general conception that abstraction is, is a Western, you know, originates from, from the West. However, it, it, is, it is the reverse. So my work is, is reclaiming that. Uh, I'm bringing attention to the fact that abstraction is, is essentially the language of African art. Now, saying that, that when I, you know, where I went to, um, you know, my college days in, in, in Ife, University of Ife, which is now called Obafe Miawolowo University, uh, there was a museum of African art next to the, to the department where there, you know, I was able to see exquisitely rendered um, sculpture pieces called the Ife heads in, in as realistic a rendering as possible. That is looking, you know, very, you know, looking at uh, um, how realistic it knows, like, uh, you know, the features would, you know, look. Uh, these, these sculpture pieces, the Ife heads are uh, uh, superbly realized, superbly rendered. Uh, so, but the idea is that when the traditional African artist is actually um, creating an image of it, someone living at the time, they tend to use realism. But when they were referring to people who had, you know, uh, died, then abstraction was the best way of capturing the essence of that person. So abstraction, both abstraction and realism were, were um, modes of expression um, in, traditional, in traditional Africa. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Yeah, this is, this is the, uh, an excerpt of what Krista Clark had actually written. I don't know if you all can see it, but let me just read it, read through it very quickly. Through the language of abstraction, Aldo seeks to create a container or a frame for the intangible that is the self in dialogue with works of African art uh, that are themselves symbolic representations of concepts. He situates his geometric abstraction firmly within African ontologies. And in doing so, he also makes tangible the intangible or perhaps hidden presence of Africa and sculpture within the legacy of Western modernism. So um, if we move quickly on to the next slide, please, thank you. Yeah, th this is, I think the question came up, I don't know whether you already asked it, Doug, but it came up in some of the series of questions you had sent to me earlier, uh, what my experience was of uh, studying in the, um, you know, in Nigeria, at the University of Ife. Well, you, you started off, in, in a very traditional Western traditional right exactly representational uh, grounding we'll call right. it 
you know, call it your uh, foundation period, perhaps. Exactly. First year or two, a year and a half or something, uh, which is very much what Western students would be studying similarly. Exactly. Um, what I was going to ask, or I had previewed with you, was um, particularly what happened when you when you finished uh, school in Nigeria and you came to the States for graduate study. Mm -hmm. uh, is that immediately when you began to make the transition from the more representational to the more either conceptual or uh, or you know? geometric with other elements. Is that right. actually when it occurred or? Yeah, it's, it's actually um, towards the end of my studies at the University of Ife, because as you can see, this, this is a painting of one of my professors at the University uh, of Ife. And he taught realism. He taught, you know, recording observation as accurately as possible, verisimilitude was a, a big thing. And he actually looks exactly like this. So, well, he looked exactly like this. Uh, he's, he's a professor at Amherst College right now. Um, so, and this is a painting of him that I made at the end of my course, um, which, you know, which I gave to him as, as a, you know, as a gift, thanking him for, because he was a fantastic professor. Um, yeah, so, I recorded observation. The head was always my, my focus, my you know, uh, area of interest. And uh, like someone said, my the head is my muse. <laughs> I am fascinated by this, you know, this this object. Well, this object, if I may call it that, which encases uh, a mysterious element called the brain, a mysterious thing called the brain, and it it has. You know, it, it has perception, it can hear, talk, and uh, it, it also, in cases, uh, contains even dreams, aspirations, and fears, imagination, everything. So it is an actually, uh, it holds a, you know, tremendous fascination for me as a form, as something to see and engage with. Uh, so I've always been fascinated by the head um, and, all of my art is about the head. In fact, I see the head, uh, the, uh, my metaphor for, for it is as a box. You know, um, I was asked to make a, a, a painting or a drawing by uh, Sony Classical of New York for John Williams's um, album, you know, two decades ago. And um, John Williams had recorded an album you know, an album of a musician, an African musician called uh, um, Bebe, okay? And he's, he had composed a piece called The Magic Box. The Magic Box for, for Bebe was uh, actually a reference to the guitar because the guitar was this box that created all these sounds. And, um, and I, I, I'd also made connection with, uh, what is called the boite à joujou, that is, this is uh, a box of toys, um, which was something that um, was quite prevalent in, in the 80s, I think, uh, in France. And, uh, but my interest in, in, in looking at the head as a box is because I have, I've always been fascinated by box. Boxes that you can't open, treasure chests, uh, boxes that are usually uh, decorated. Um, it's there's something mysterious about it, especially if you can't open it, if you don't know <laughs> what is inside it. There's something magical about it. So uh, for me, the head, you know, it, the metaphor for for the head is is that magic box where everything happens, where the world of the individual actually takes place. Um, everything we see, perceive, understand, actually actually takes place in the head, science tells us. Um, so the whole thing about, you know, the divide between inside and outside is a very fluid one because sometimes outside is inside, inside is outside. We can't really verify what is actually outside because sometimes even color, 
it's not supposed to exist in the in the outside world itself it's is made up by the neuro you know is made up inside our heads you know be, between the the uh, as we in as the um the brain eye interprets um waves of you know electromagnetic waves of light so it is a very i mean that is something that is something i've always been fascinated by and uh will probably take us away from <laughs> from the focus of this evening's well uh, uh, let me insert here i when we were talking one of the things i mentioned to you was uh will barnett on a, on one of the occasions that he spoke at artist talk uh was talking about the transition that occurred prior to you know after after or during world war ii and then thereafter mm -hmm. that prior to world war ii he felt and his life of course was uh literally a century long that uh everything was outer directed before world war ii mm. after world war ii rose abstract expressionism rose many different forms in which uh things were much more inner directed mm -hmm. they were about ideas about concepts about feelings uh which didn't really exist in the same way with rare exceptions prior um uh the other thought i had which i would share and then we'll we'll move on is um when you were still in africa when you were still studying at ife um were you seeing art history were you seeing for example jmw turner or ancient japanese chinese korean uh brush drawings and you know which which is so abstract in their nature. Was any of that penetrating your space when you were still in Nigeria? Yeah, I think what, what we, we, of course, we took a course in, in art history. Um, you know, we studied, studied Renaissance art, you know, Leonardo, all of this, um, mm -hmm. early Renaissance to, you know, to the height of Renaissance in the 16th century um studied uh impressionism and stuff like that um there was a short very short course course in uh in african art uh strange very strangely um mm -hmm. most of the perhaps because african art uh was something you experienced on a day-to-day -day basis you know you were you just lived it it was part of your day-to-day -day, um experience we saw the masquerades we saw those carvings uh, we visited museums. We saw traditional African arts in museums. Um, but the, the, my, my training, uh, my, you know, my training was in, in academic art, basically, uh, you know, recording observation, learning about color, acquiring the tools for self-expression. Um, but it was a personal curiosity of mine that actually drew me to, um, to looking more closely at the works of uh, African art, con contemporary then, you know, but modern art, modern African artists uh, who were working and exhibiting in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, mm -hmm. So it was something. It was it was a uh, something I'd been imbibed from my own personal uh, curiosities, you know, which drove me to to looking into those. Let's let's move on a little in terms of images and. Okay, so the uh, so these are these are some of the works I did then too, um, you know, Howard Jordan was a student he had actually visited, and um, and posed. So we were drawing and painting from post model. Now this is actually the campus of Ife. Uh huh. Yeah, where I studied. Um, I. I hardly did landscape paintings, but I think I remember doing maybe three or four, <laughs> and this is one of them right. in oil or masonite. Yeah, so if we move on to the next. Okay, so here, now this is this actually I had written an article, well, an essay rather that was published in uh, Oxford Companion to the Mind. I was invited to do that. So this is an illustration. I'd submitted for that article, looking at the uh, Yoruba concept of the mind. 
So for the Yoruba, basically the, the head or the world of the individual is, is you know, uh, symbolized or represented by a circle. Now this circle is actually the, um, the kind of map of consciousness. Consciousness has four main, in fact, five main components. The, the physical head, Okay, so the physical head will be at the uh, at the top, and then to the south is the. Uh, let me see if I can see that clearly now. The uh, the okay, sorry, I misled you. The <laughs> the eternal head is in the north, as you can see where the image of the of a head is. The uh, be, you know the south of that is the physical head. Okay. Now the body, which is also a part of consciousness, is to the west, and then the soul or the emir or spirit is to the east. Now, in the center of all of this is what is called the inner head. So basically, there is this notion of the the, the physicality of the head itself refers to the outer head, that is Oriol day, and then the and within it is contained. The, the inner head or orinu. So this notion of a head within a head, uh, this duality of the tangible physical head and the intangible uh, inner head or, or the, the consciousness of self, the spiritual consciousness of self uh, is, is part of the basic um, concept of, of every, 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 every African I can say, but in this particular case, every Yoruba person. So my work has always been about, up until, I mean, whilst I was in college, I was focusing on the outer head, recording it as accurately as possible. But once I finished and starting from, uh, you know, my studies at University of Georgia, I was focusing more. I was more inner directed, just like you said, uh, even though I didn't go through all the wars to, to see, to do this, but I was more inner director looking at the, the, what is this intangible essence of self? So that had always been my, my area of focus and interest. Um, if we move on to the next, now in the Yoruba tradition, uh, there is obviously, as you can see, geometry is informing um, the container, as you can see here. Um, you know, there is the conical shape of the hat, that that is one and then there is the container where the where the um, hat is put you know at night okay now this this is this is like this is called the house of the head <laughs> it's mm -hmm. called the house of the head because the the head itself the the the, the if we are looking at the um the king of, of, of a town, for example, he would be referred to as the, as the head of a house. That is the house as a body politic. He would be referred to as, as the head of it. So at night he puts his hat, which is the head in a container, which is like the house, you know, the house of the head. So there are always these dual, you know, dual aspects to all kinds of, uh, you know, to the, to, to the understanding of consciousness and it plays itself out in this simple, uh, perhaps even ritualistic objects. So if we move on to the next. Now, this work I, I did in 2002, uh, titled Outer and Inner Head, actually now in the collection of uh, the Newark Museum. Uh, the idea here is that if you look at the center of the painted panel on the, on the left, and stare fixedly at a point uh, for about two minutes. Well, 20 seconds rather, not two minutes, 20 seconds. And transfer your gaze to this to similar point on the drawn panel on the right. You will see the complementary color that you have of the colors you've been, just been looking at. Uh, so you will see, you know, like very pale blue, very pale green at the bottom. Um, as, you know, after image would basically the phenomenon of after image would, would happen. 
Now, this, this after image will linger for about a few seconds and disappears. So this intangible experience of color that is made up uh, within the neurology of the, of the viewer uh, is, is my way of referring to this intangible essence of self, such that though we are not able to see it, 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 is, it, is, it is present anyhow. So this is that dualism playing out. This is the tangible, quote unquote, I'm saying quote unquote, tangible color, because obviously color doesn't have a physical existence in the outside world, so it's all in our head. But for this purpose, I'm saying tangible color because it's painted on with a brush. And, uh, and to, on, the, on the right, what is experienced is a virtual, purely, completely intangible color that appears and fades. So that's the, um, that's the idea behind this. Um, if we move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so that work itself was, in, was influenced by the geometry uh, of this Teke mask from Democrat, Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, so pretty much like uh, Picasso had been influenced by the Congo Congo uh, mask he had seen to create the Le Demoiselle d'Avignon. I was fascinated by the, uh, with the, with the geometry of this form and the way the, 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 the top half of the, of the head is pushed forward and the lower part is pushed back. If we go back to the, to the previous slide of the outer inner head painting and drawing, please, for a minute. Is it possible? It should be. Uh, Natalia, to the previous slide. Yes, that one. You will see how I have pushed back the lower part of the of the uh, form too, um, because there's a way it just gives you a sense in which there is some definition of of facial feature there. It gives it that that feeling. Okay, thank you. If we move on to the, yeah, to this one. So this idea of a head as a box uh, informed my creating this work in the collection of the uh, British Museum. Uh, basically, is the as you can see, it's a rectangular box, and there are about five hundred and nine safety pins stitched onto that. I I did I never counted it, but. I was, I was teaching at a school, um, a high school in the UK at the time. I was head of art and design there. And one of my colleagues had actually gone to the British, British Museum where this was, was being uh, shown at the time. And he's a, he's, a, you know, he's a math teacher. So he went there and he counted all the, all the safety pins on it and told me how many there were. I didn't even know. But I find that very interesting that when we go to museums, things we see that are significant to, to us are different from one person to the next. And I really appreciated that. So, so to make the um, allusion to uh, a head more, more uh, real, if I can put it that way, I had stitched yarn through paper, which is one of, one of the first times I had actually used yarn with work on paper. I stitched yarn through paper and, and plated the, you know, the each about six or so strands together uh, as you would uh, plate hair in Nigeria. If you remember the, the hairstyles I showed you earlier. So that technique, that's, that styling is what was used to do this. So, and it's in the, it's titled Juju um, because Juju is this mysterious object you have in the corner of your room and you, you can worship it or say prayers to it and stuff like this. Uh, so this is what I, you know, what uh, informed the, my titling this Juju. If, if we move on to the next, please. Now this work was done Back in 1995, I was, uh, it is a sketch for one of the wall drawings I did at the Kwangju Biennale. 
and um, now in the collection of the Smithsonian Institution. And um, again, this is about the head. Uh, I just created an organic type shape, which, is, which refers more to the body than to the head, to be honest with you. But the, the rectangular bit in the middle, uh, which is actually, which, which is the part that refers to the head, I'd actually written, instead of drawing the facial features, I'd written the facial features in, uh, you know, eyes, mouth, ears, nose, um, a stand in for facial features so that by reciting those words, you would image, you would image them in, into place. Um, what I found fascinating was that when people came to, to my booth, you know, my temporary, temporary studio or gallery or booth, at the, at the Biennale, uh, mostly Koreans, because English, maybe the, you know, is a language they're not familiar, too familiar, maybe they were learning it. But ev I found it fascinating that everyone that came there stood and recited those, those uh, you, know, you know, the eyes, mouth, ears, nose, they all just did. Once they came in, it was just eyes, mouth, Ears, nose, all of them did. And I thought that was really interesting. So uh, if we can move on to the next, please. So for this, this work, which, which I did after returning from the Kwanju Biennale, uh, I, I, um, I incorporated the recitation of the features into, into the work. You know, as if you are calling, calling someone into being. You are describing them. You know, as and I recorded myself re reciting like a litany of a being. You know, eyes, mouth, ears, nose, and what can happen within the head, like imagining, um, thinking, worrying. You know, being happy. All of these phenomenal experiences that can take place inside the head. Uh, so this this is actually titled Talking Head. Um, I had recorded all of this in a, in a, at that time, a cassette player uh, and inserted uh, a loudspeaker, a small loudspeaker within the icon that represents the mouth um, and two elliptical forms that represented the eyes and a triangular form that represents the nose. And I had stitched yarn across the ends of nails, which I'd nailed onto a board at the back of the, of the paper. Uh, so when you come to the work, you would hear it reciting a litany of, you know, as if calling is someone into being. So this is in the collection of uh, the Smithsonian. So if we can move on to the next, please. So this is uh, actually a piece I did in, uh, again, in 20. 2002, shown at the um, Science Museum for five months. It was part of, a, of an exhibition where we were looking, titled Head On. Eight artists were invited to respond to the head and create work. And uh, <clears throat> one of the works I created was this one, including the outer and inner head, which is currently at the, uh, you know, in the collection of the New York Museum. So this one, a simple figure eight form rests against the wall, a false wall through which um, a mechanical eye had been insert, you know, inserted uh, with a proximity sensor uh, concealed in the corner between the, the, the ceiling and the wall. Now the proximity sensor when someone is a motion sensor as well. So when someone comes close to the work within 10 feet of the work, the proximity sensor senses the presence of the person triggers the eye to open. And if the person stays still for three seconds, the eye remains open and, uh, and shuts after three seconds. But if the person moves or stares, the eye opens again. Uh, the whole idea was that it's titled The Seeing Mind. Uh, the whole idea is that uh, it is not the eyes that actually see, it is the mind that sees through the eyes because the eyes just process you know, via neural, neural impulses, which, which something within 
the being of the person interprets those, all those neural impulses to, to sight, shape, taste, color. Yeah, so these are the things that influence me that I'm interested in and have always created work in response to. Can we move on to the next case? So this is someone looking at the eye of, <laughs> uh, you know, the opened eye. And um, the, the uh, Welcome Trust collection actually sent me this picture because they had it, they had it on view for about 10 years. And uh, due to mental fatigue and all that, they had to you know, take the sculpture piece down. Okay, thank you. If you move on to the next slide, please. The uh, other times I've used yarn in my work is this, where I've looked at very simple shape, uh, which stand you know, as a representation for the head and uh, yarn and then woven as you would in, in, hair, in traditional African hairstyling, uh, shapes that look like the mouth, the nose, and the eye, very geometricized, stylized abstraction. Again, in the private collection in, in London, titled Nikkei. So the next one, I have also used yarn to describe an outline of a form and inscribed things inside the form, like the body is a symbol of the unconscious, um, you know, the inner head, the outer head, uh, you know, the, the head is the seat of consciousness and home of destiny, the, but the feet take you there, all these sort of ideas. Uh, <clears throat> which are which are ways in which people engage with with the human being, you know, in in, in Nigeria, in the private collection in uh, Darmstadt in Germany. Okay, okay, if you move on to the next piece, yeah. But when I did that, page, sorry, when I did that work, the one that preceded this, my father had just died then, so. I titled it, The Earth is Pregnant with My Father. So because of you know, this mound where he was buried and I was affected very deeply and it, you know, I created that work. Uh, so this is titled Breath. Um, so you can see a bit more clearly these shapes that represent the mouth with the with loudspeaker in, in the middle of that and shapes that would represent eyes, and then the triangle always represented the nose in the way I worked. Um, nails, very tiny nails all around the edges of these forms with yarn stitched across or roped across, if you like, uh, the top edges of the nails to create this form. So there's a, this whole thing about the yellow of pastel and the yellow of yarn and then the blue of night um, and it's called breath as, and I recorded myself breathing in and exhaling, inhaling, exhaling. Um, because if you remember the, the geography of consciousness that I've shown you in the, in the circular format, the uh, part of consciousness is the breath or the spirit. So this is, this is the breath part. Okay, if you move on to the next list. Now I have a landscape in my head. Uh, this is about how in dream, um, one can be, you know, laying in bed, one can actually be, you know, the REM state, rapid eye movement state. One can be in the landscape walking, even flying in a dream and stuff like that. I found that fascinating uh, as a subject matter for art. And I created a shape which is somehow like a, a head, you know, a house within a head uh, with, with the letter set writing, I have a landscape in my head, I have a landscape in my head. If you read it to the, to the end, it says, I have a land of escape <laughs> in my head. So in a, in a collection at the Schmidt Bank. So next slide, please. Yeah, so this idea of flight in dream uh, also in, 
you know, um, if, if I was pretty much engaged with that idea at the time. And then the, I was invited to do the, to take part in the Kwanju Biennale. And I thought a winged head would be uh, a good icon for, for the exhibition, which was titled Crossing Borders. And they really liked it and used it as one of the images for the five posters they, they created for the Biennale. Thank you. So if we can move on quickly to the next. Again, flight in a dream or free falling, if you like. Uh, the rectangular part in graphite with the multicolored strands of uh, pastel colors uh, to, re to as a representation of the rapid eye movement thing uh, and, uh, and arms, limbs, I see free falling. It's in the collection of the Horniman Museum. Okay, next slide, please. So this one is where I was looking at the head as a, as a box, uh, but in this case, an open box on one end, not like the, British, the one in the British Museum with the representations of hair, but in this case, it's actually an open box. And you can see into it, and it's a mysteriously black box. Um, so the blackness in this case represents everything you, can, you cannot see and everything that is unknowable about the origin of consciousness, what about its, its nature even, uh, its intangible nature, um, how did it, where did it come from? How did it become, what is consciousness? So these are all the questions that, uh, you know, drew me to making this shape, um, looking at the sheen of, of graphite to, and contrast that with the mat of black pastel. Uh, so in this, in this work and this series of works, I'm looking at the elements of sheen and matte, both as not only as form, but also as meaning, because in the Yoruba idea, um, consciousness came about from the ontological um, friction, if you like, between the forces of light and the forces of dark or darkness, forces of light, um, give off light and forces of darkness absorb it. So between this um, expansion and, and contraction, uh, you, you have, you know, it gives rise to consciousness. This is the idea. So that is, that is the idea behind this in the uh, collection of the Hood Museum in New Hampshire. Next slide, please. Since I don't have this in front of me, about how many more slides do you have? Uh, let's see. Maybe a dozen or. Okay, so let me move very quickly. I mean, the, the rest are similar to those. If we can, we can skip because I've basically explained what that is. Okay. So, yeah, I'll just go through them while you talk. Okay, right. So if you just, yeah, just right. So this is the same idea. Mm -hmm. And you can see the, the African arts image that informed the shape itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you move on to the next one, it has the two objects there. And you can see the geometry and the influence from that to that. Mm -hmm. and, and this is actually influenced by the hairstyle of Jenna Je Monet. In the next slide, uh -huh. you see that. Next slide. Yeah, you can see how uh -huh. you know, the influence for that. And this is the Aquaba doll informed by the Aquaba doll with outstretched arms, but the arms are now part of the features, the ears, the nose. Okay. And the Dogon bird mask. And you can uh -huh. see it there. And then the um, in the mud wash collection this is self-portrait the self is that intangible essence in the dark space there framed or contained by the outer so this was part of my experience in uh in Kwangju making a large scale 
wall drawing. So this, this deals with wall drawings. And the what I actually made, this is the sketch for it, which is also in the collection of the Smithsonian, looking at the, you know, the shapes for the eyes and as if they were carved objects. So this was done at the um, Arts Westchester, looking at hairstyling, the head as the cylindrical container. This was when I returned to sculpture, mm -hmm. um, looking at a frame for the, you know, for the uh, for the head, and this is informed by. Okay, this is another one. That one was informed by the shape of the Benin head of the Benin Queen Mother. This one by the traditional hairstyling in in Yoruba. So this is um, the Red Cap Chief uh, in a private collection in, in Detroit. This was the first time of returning to color after having made a lot, series of works in black and white, gray as well. And that work is now this being- whole area, This whole area of your uh, iteration of right. your work. Was one we also talked about, and I I brought up uh, the core ten pieces of Richard Serra, which okay. are monoch monochromatic, but they have a lot of a lot of texture, right? Uh, and then the geometric works, which are solid black, of if there is such a thing, right. of Tony Smith, the late Tony Smith, mm -hmm. uh, very geometric, purely geometric. Um, although he got playful with it at times and he would move things around in the field uh, and make your eye, you know, you'd have to kind of play with that yourself to, to see the composition. And then the work of Anthony Caro or Alexander Lieberman, right. where they, they work rather monochromatically. So they have big, bold pieces, but they'd be all red or all yellow or all blue, dark blue or whatever. Often just monochromatic, very rarely with another color, uh, maybe sometimes with a second color. Um, not that I'm directly drawing a comparison, but it's interesting that this is among your most cu current work, yes? Right. Um, so that, that, one, that has me leading to the question, other than the head, right. and you've spoken about that in great detail, very illuminating, who or what other influences would you say you've had or still or still have? What are the powerful driving more contemporary things that are going on in you with you? Right. So the uh, the in terms of um, American art, uh, the the artists that have attracted my attention or interest strongly. Mm -hmm would be two, two of them actually, uh, in, in painting Ellsworth Kelly. Uh -huh. uh, but in definitely see that. <laughs> right, but in, in okay. sculpture is, is um, David Smith. Uh -huh. David Smith, okay. uh, especially um, his uh, QB or QBI series. Right. So with Wait. David Smith, with David Smith, I would say I see the parallel very strongly there. Right. Because it's the the cubic, you know, dimensions of things, and the scratches and the texture. Right. He combines in almost everything he did. Right. Right. So I really, what I really enjoyed about uh, looking at David Smith's work is the way he he gets a you know stainless steel and scrapes things yeah. across it expressionistically. Right. Um, I really enjoyed looking at that. But more interestingly, what, I, what I've realized was that uh, because my work came, came about from looking at the head as a box, right? Sometimes I open the, you know, the, the lid, <laughs> okay? Sometimes I take both lid and back off, and then you mm -hmm. have a frame left. Uh, so these are the structurally, the, this is how I played with my form. And, uh, and then find that, okay, wow, so there's someone called David Smith. And then I bought a, you know, my wife actually bought me a book mm -hmm. uh, as a gift, the birthday gift of David Smith's work. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, this guy needs to look into, look at him because his 
the you know the grasp of form he has i really i really find that very enjoy mm -hmm. enjoyable rather uh but my work is influenced more by abstract geometric possibilities i see in traditional african art like this god head or the god mask mm -hmm. uh in form influencing all of that and looking at color um you know different kinds of green different kinds of you know red orange and how all of these come together mm -hmm. right now the the last segment looks at uh my yarn my current yarn and pastel work and is based on uh, influenced a lot or inspired by the egungun egungun masquerade where someone dons a whole costume and uh the the face of the wearer obviously is covered by this knitted yarn based fabric they can see through it but and breathe through, you know, through two, but you can't obviously see them. Now, what I find fascinating is that once they are covered off like that, uh, the identity of the wearer is covered. There's something subconscious uh, presence that that you see. Okay, so uh, I, I really like the impact of that. It, it gives me a kind of primal experience. Of, uh, of something mysterious. And this is something I, 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 I um, capture in, in, my, in my yarn and, and, uh, and um, pastel work. This is another example. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was when I was putting this together that I realized that, okay, that's true. I mean, they're actually using black and white <laughs> yarn too. Um, so you imbibe some of these be, things. Some of, some of these things, I look at them and I say, it could be Japanese. Yeah, yeah. well, it, it isn't. It, it, is. it could be America, uh, South American, you know, it could be uh, or not anywhere. Anywhere, but, you know, certain cultures. Right. It's amazing the uh, the connection. Or yeah. But this is as inadvertent, this. probably, but the connection. Mm -hmm. But this is as Yoruba as it comes. Right. <laughs> So, um, and you can see geometry there, everything. So, um, and color and mystery. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, what I would like to do is take you, because I'm, I'm anxious to allow people to ask some questions. Okay. Uh, but I, as a transition to that, I'd like you to speak to for a few minutes. What is it about blackness? Now, by blackness, I mean in the color black. Mm -hmm. The way you're rendering it, sometimes very solidly, and many times with a lot of subtlety, particularly with, with the use of graphite. Mm -hmm. What is it about that blackness, which is not readable by the human eye, and which you are obviously attempting, I would say with a great deal of success, Thanks. to render, to render. Mm -hmm. So you're you're allowing us in to what is otherwise um somewhat ununderstandable. Talk about that for a few minutes, mm -hmm. and then we're going to allow people to ask some questions. Okay. So the um the my use of black um again is black not as an absence of, of light, but as light that cannot that is imperceivable by the eyes. What I mean by that is that. If you do, if you can't see something, it is not there <laughs> um, mm -hmm. for you, right? Uh, if we look at the full spectrum of light, right, we, the the bit we can actually see, you know, the electromagnetic spectrum, the bit we can see is from two hundred millimicrons to like four hundred. You know, you have infrared or you have infrared or ultraviolet, X ray, gamma rays, and all these other rays. We can't see them with our eyes. So they might as well be black because they, they, it looks like there's no light there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so black in that sense is, uh, is, is color. I mean, it's light, but we are not equipped, you know, to, to see those, you know, that, that, to see them it, as light. One extreme end right. of perception of light. Right, right. Yeah, both ends actually, you know, both ends. Because the, 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 the bit we can see is right some, somewhat in the middle. 
and uh, and it's a very tiny tiny band. Um, so we can try as hard as as we want. We cannot we cannot see everything that we cannot see reality as it truly really is. <laughs> Um, I'm fascinated by that, and um, and and I see that consciousness is uh, is something super mysterious like that, and uh, and it's what I have devoted my practice to to respond to, um, and and uh, created metaphors for it. You know, the box, the the empty box, uh, uh, the space, the nothingness described by the forms I create, um, the tangible, the intangible. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is this is also responding to the masquerade idea. In, in fact, it's called the Gungu and it was done first in 2001. Um, the next one is also, the next slide is um, the same. You can see the black and the white and then the color all of these are in private collections. The next one would probably show other colors interacting with it. And these colors, um, I'm tapping into color symbolism with these colors and looking at red, you know, signifying uh, strength, courage, love, sometimes aggression. <laughs> so this is subtitled strength because of the, uh, the red color there. Okay, and uh, and this is blue. So these are these sculpture pieces came about uh, as a response to my yarn mast head pieces, looking at the black and white, black and white, and one single color. Mm -hmm. um, let's let's allow for some. Uh, oh, that's the end of it. Anyway. That's the end. Okay. Good time. Thank you. <laughs> uh, do we have a few questions? Uh, normally, we would go through the chat, but please feel free to unmute yourself, whoever wishes to address a question, and address the question or make a comment. Don't be bashful. But unmute yourself if you wish to speak, obviously. Okay. Oh, Sylvia. Yes, hi. I want to say thank you so much, Osi, for this really fascinating um, presentation and talking about the origins of <coughs> contemporary art and Africa, not the origins, but the interrelationship between <coughs> formal African forms and contemporary art as, as it has been appropriated. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Just want to say thank you. I really else? enjoyed it. Yeah, no, I really, and I can hardly wait to get down to Washington to see your work. Uh, thank you so much. Very exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you. So so I would like to ask you a question. Do you do the painting first and then do a sculpture from the painting? Yes, I mean, the paintings, more recently, the paintings have happened first. And then even though the sculpture pieces, sometimes they look, they resemble some of the form in the painting very closely, but they are not bound to those same exact forms. They, the inspired, I think inspired by the paintings is the best way of putting it, right? Well, I say your work is absolutely exquisite and I would Thank love, so I would just love to see it in person because I had a hard time understanding the yarn um, okay. because I couldn't see it in the texture of the photograph. So oh, okay. um, is there a gallery in New York that carries your work? Yes. Two, ga two galleries, actually. The uh, Skoto Gallery, S-K-O-T-O. -O. Yes. Gallery in Chelsea. Yes. And the Sundaram Tagore Gallery. 
Oh, that one you have to spell. Okay. Well, that's also in Chelsea. That's S U N S U N D A Yes. R A M. Yes. Tagore T A G. Yes. O R E. Okay, and that's in Chelsea too. In Chelsea, Twenty Sixth Street, I think. West Twenty Sixth. Well, I, I look so forward to seeing your work. It's really a pleasure to listen to you. You oh. have an incredible brain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, it, and it's in his head. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted I wanted to say something that, you know, I, I had actually found this in trying to prepare some thoughts for the conversation. And uh, and OC had not seen this or read it, which is the uh, when you look up the surname of Odu, what you find through Googling it is creative one, one with deep insight. Oh my God! A motivator, oh my sensational God. speaker. Oh yes. He had never yeah. seen this, and I thought, how apt could that be? Incredible. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank so, you so much. I'm going to look, like, look it up myself. Thank okay. you. <laughs> what I would like to say in closing is, of course, thank you to Osi Adu, uh, to our programming director, Kristen Eichenberg, uh, to our Zoom and YouTube volunteers, our new board member, Maruna Stratton, and Natalia Dragnea. Uh, and thanks to our board and other volunteers and interns. And we hope you will join us next Monday. And thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you so thank much. You.